I'm, I'm new to the city and I have to say that I have been so impressed with what's going on here. I had no idea before I got here, so fantastic. I'll try to offer a different opinion, though I'm awfully excited about what's going on in our tech sector. I think it's just the beginning. I think there's so much more opportunity for what we could do. I think we got to get a lot of synergy between the players. I think it's awesome to see Canary here. It's awesome to see NSERC here, my tax here. These are people that up at UVic I talk to a lot. And then when I come downtown, you know, I get to see Rob Bennett and I get to see what's going on with Aaron and Ladies Learning Code. And, and there are all these great initiatives that really need to be synergized and give opportunities not only to our 18-year-olds that are coming into our programs up at UVic, but also people that are in the community that already have careers and degrees and want to get into the tech sector, they got to have a way in. I've met fantastic people that are interested in that. I look around in downtown Victoria and frankly, I'm a little concerned. I look up and I see vacancies and I don't think there's any reason for that. I think that we've got everything that we need to just absolutely hit it out of the ballpark. But if we don't pull together, we're going to stay in this kind of mediocre state. I don't think Vancouver has the land of opportunity that we have here, <laughs> though they have lots going on. We could really capitalize and move, but we really have to get together and pull together to do it. So I'm very optimistic. I think it's a great vibe, but we've only just begun. I think I'm on a different planet <laughs> as of being the biomed sector, but I've been really excited. A lot of, um, some of you may have heard of Starfish Medical, which is doing really well. We've had some other biotech companies move here to the island. And from that perspective, um, being involved with the biomedical engineering program, which is new at UVic, I think there's a lot of opportunities in that sector, which I'd really like to see grow. And I do think one of the, the things um, knowing people who work in some of the, the startups downtown is actually getting people connected with things like NSERC, with MyTax, and, and showing people that if you do want to invest, like, and everyone's free to talk to me about this, I'm like, I can tell you exactly how to leverage your money to the maximum to uh, take advantage of all these things to promote businesses. And I think it's actually a really, um, I think Canada and actually BC in general, especially with some of the stuff that was announced at the tech what was that BC Tech conference that was in January? I think it's actually a really good time to invest because there, there's money out there. You just need really good ideas to take through. And just again, I'll say, please, start more biotechs here <laughs> in Victoria. <laughs> good, great. Um, so how has your organization, this is sort of easy for you to answer, how has your organization helped women or startups in Victoria? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we focus on women and youth. Uh, so we, um, well, we do focus on a very social collaborative uh, type of learning environment. Uh, we have four mentors to every one learner. So that, of course, um, uh, kind of, we're, we're hoping to drop this uh, intimidation barrier for someone that isn't, uh, that's new to tech so that, that they can come in there and, and feel pretty comfortable to get going. And um, I don't know, I think that's the main one. Oh, also um, Purpose Social. We, what, what I saw in Ladies Learning Code is that, you know, we have all these great people coming through the courses, but they're just one day courses. Uh, and we have people that say, you know, I wanna change my career actually. And, um, you know, there are lots of wonderful programs, UVic, Camosun, Q College, all these different programs. Um, but I was looking for something that was um, a little more intense and short term for people that just wanted to dive into uh, software development careers. So that's why we brought Lighthouse Labs over. And uh, so, so I would say that that's, and then provided, um, we provide scholarships for, for women in, um, who want to pursue their computer science career in, in any different institution. So I think uh, overall I'd have to say that um, uh, as an educational institution, and I can't speak for uh, all educational institutions, but certainly we've seen problems with uh, getting a diverse set of uh, people engaged with our courses. Now, a lot of times, again, we're up at, at uh, UVic for a computer science degree. That means that people are coming in, they're 18 years old. Uh, are we seeing a lot of diversity going into computer science yet? Actually, no, and we've been working on this for years and years and years, and it's a really tough problem, but, I think that the synergy with the startup community and certainly 
synergizing with Ladies Learning Code and what's going on with people who are already partway through their careers and wanting to make a change and looking at it as a whole landscape of people, not just the 18-year-olds coming in. I think the long term, we got to get into K through 12 and we're working on curriculum change and all that kind of thing. The schools have to be able to offer exposure to technology. And certainly, one of the things that Ladies Learning Code has also is Girls Learning Code and just getting kids in general interested, just getting that diversity factor higher, making sure that people feel like, yeah, I might not want to go into computer science or I might want, want to lead a whole new area of engineering like Stephanie has, but I'm actually interested in technology for X. And so I'm going to get my exposure to taking these programming courses and, and, and technology. So we've got lots to do in the long run and lots to do in education. But I do think that right now in the short term, the time is now to capitalize on things in community here like Aaron has built. And we did that with our course, our first um, pilot offering down here in Fort Tectoria was actually we just tapped into people that were coming through Ladies Learning Code and said, hey, do you want to try a different type of course now? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> but then we opened it up, we got even more people from community and recognized that there was just, you know, there's just a big party going on down here. <laughs> and, and you don't have to be, you know, committed to that four-year degree. You can get in at any stage and you can get in at any point and you can make technology work for you. And I think we have like entrepreneurs in residence up at, uh, is that what you're called, Noah? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> up at you, Vic, and we're trying to stimulate that connection. But I would say, um, really, for you, Vic, it would be really good for us to get out of that ivory tower more and be downtown more and be working with more synergy. And I think that would be good. I think we've started it, but we could do more. Um. I will say, before I get into the, <laughs> um, our biomedical engineering program at UVic is pretty close to 50-50 in terms of uh, men and women, and so that's really good. And so we are, we have with BME and civil being introduced at UVic, we've actually had a huge shift in our, in our um, demographics applying. And I will say just in general, both as a, as a woman and, and also uh, cognitive minorities, engineering has a marketing problem. And I know this as an engineer who hangs out with engineers all the time, is like, please leave me alone, I need to solve some problems. And <laughs> in fact, one of the biggest indicators of who becomes engineers is that you have a family member who's engineers. Because in high school, you actually do take physics and chemistry and even coding and things like that. But there's not actually engineering. And so even when I talk to high school kids, you have to be like, okay, so engineering is the practical application of science. And you can even ask engineers in our program and they can't define what engineering is. And so I think that's one of the things that's getting out there that you know, engineering really provides a lot of opportunities, um, not just to, to women, but to everybody in general, because we aren't making it seem as appealing as other things. And so I think that's uh, one of the challenges. And I do think it, it makes everyone better to have a diverse um, population of engineers working in that um, instead of the opposite way. What was, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> what else do we do? How have, how's your organization helped women or startups? Yeah, well, and, and well, one of the other interesting things um, about like when they've uh, shown studies about like what women prefer in their careers and why engineering is a good career is that uh, if you are an engineer, you can have flexibility in your careers, and so that's one of the reasons why women are drawn to civil and BME is that like, if you start your own civil engineering company, you can actually sort of create how your life is going to look and, and run, and that's something that people find really attractive. And I think, again, with engineering's marketing problem, that some of that just doesn't actually come through, that like, actually by having an degree, it gives you this power to, to shape your life and how you want to see it. And so I think that you know, we need to work on marketing our profession a bit better. <laughs> Are there questions from the audience about women in tech or? On uh, April 21st, there is a, a big event the Greater School of Victoria is doing, or uh, the School District of Victoria is doing, and Ladies Learning Code will be there um, to speak with all these girls in high school. And you're right, it's just, I just try to get volunteers to just show up, because sometimes it's just seeing, just seeing women talk about stuff. That's all, they just need to see it. So Junior Achievement it is works. a good program to hook into and then uh, introduce the program to a lot of the high school students, and I think it's really good. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, as an employer of engineers and technical people, uh, what should I be doing better from your perspective? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> such a good, I was, so I actually worked in tech for two years and left. Be, to, become, to go back to academia, so let me answer that question yeah. partially. 
Um, so I worked at Google, which is supposed to be one of the best places to work and you know, great. There was a great atmosphere, but I just wasn't driven by the problems I was working on. And um, I tried to find ways to make my work more interesting and my, my bosses weren't open to it. And um, so I think that women tend to be driven not by the technical problems, but the way that their technical problems can shape and change the world. So maybe that's a, a gender stereotype, but I think that um, women appreciate seeing how their work changes the landscape, not just that um, they've solved a technical problem, but that they're, the way that they solve the problem changes things. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you guys have input on that. I would say that's very true. In fact, a lot of the work that we do with Girls Learning Code is about making sure we're really connecting the uh, coding that they're learning that day with world changing problems so that they get that this is actually access to that. Um, the other thing, what can you do? Uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of research on something as simple as uh, changing words on a job um, posting from, you know, these are your required things to these are preferred. And I've heard there's great companies locally, um, and you might already be doing this, but uh, uh, I know Predio does this, and also uh, Beanstream, they've, they've shared this with me, that um, they just changed, they, they limited their uh, required things to kind of more cultural and aptitude for learning. Um, when I was on a uh, women in tech panel just not too long ago for Net Squared Victoria, I invited uh, the CEO of Beanstream, Craig Thompson, to come and speak on the panel, and it was for that reason, that often women in tech panels, there's only women in the room, and you know, that's great, but yeah, at some point, it's like, actually, we need to involve all voices in this conversation, so. Other questions? Uh -huh. Oh, there's a micro. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, can hear you, Kevin. I thought I was loud I can enough. Hear you. <laughs> How do you guys feel to get the gap between, you know, your, your career and then moving into the startup industry? Because there's very few women in the, in the startup sector. And, and, and entrepreneurs in particular, yeah. Um, how right? You had a microphone, and then it wasn't oh. on. Possibly, <laughs> now I can hear you. Okay, there it is. How how do you see to get women to transition from you know a, basically a stable career into the into the startup uh, um, community? Uh, there's very few women startups uh, led by women, and how do you see that transaction happening? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. Um, Again, I, I kind of fall back on some research stuff about how you communicate things. So often startups are communicated as sort of this, you know, it is, it's very adventurous. There's a lot of risk. There's, um, you know, danger, that kind of thing, you know, which is very exciting. Adventure, risk, da -da, those are words that typically speak to uh, young men <laughs> and or men of all ages. That um, is a really awesome thing to go for, whereas women, just psychologically, and these are huge generalizations, um, are typically more uh, wanting uh, less risk. And so uh, what I've seen in the startup community is where um, you can actually show, sometimes you're just using different words a little bit, but showing, you know, actually you can talk about flexibility in your career. You can talk about um, options for, you know, raising your children at, in your own way that you want to and creating a career around that. Um, these are things that typically speak more to women um, rather than, you know, just all out, full on risk, leap off a cliff, go s do a startup. It's like, well, actually, you know, here are the skills you need and, and here's a path forward. Um, it's a tough question. I mean, really, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I was uh, one of the few that, that have done that and, uh, and it, it was really risky and there, you know, I also, failed one big and failed big. So, um, you, you know, you can't sidestep that, so. I think, uh, I mean, I, I, for me, I, I sort of feel a little bit like I'm still amazed by the startup community and I'm so optimistic about where it's gonna go and especially a community like this in Victoria. I think it's about making sure that everybody knows that the opportunity's out there and you can get involved. I think in uh, the, the big startup slam that was in Vancouver last year, two high school girls won. 
<laughs> like it was like I guess they didn't know they weren't supposed to or something. <laughs> and so I mean I think it's just about making sure that boy um, uh, certainly there's a there's a lot of research and there's a lot of uh, issues about making sure that the community is supportive and these kinds of things. But I also think it's just like okay let's just open the doors let's make sure everybody gets involved and it's not necessarily about oh I see myself as a future entrepreneur that could do well successful financially. It's you know in particular with the um, the project that won it was about making sure that people could detect if there were any toxins in the food they were eating and this these kids just wanted to change the world they didn't know they were gonna win this startup slam <laughs> so I think again it's just about making sure the community is open that there's opportunity and we get the pipeline going but I agree lots of challenges lots of good questions I hope that uh, you know from an academic standpoint I hope that you know this community can be so much more agile than a university can you know? <laughs> and so it can be really attractive for many different reasons and incorporate many different dynamics that would make it attractive for people um, yeah, like I was gonna say, well, a lot of our students are entrepreneurial, definitely out of mechanical engineering at UVic, and I feel I'm like, and UVic also has a thing called ICE, which I don't know. You guys can probably figure out with letters something, commercialization. Oh, there, there you go. Um, so I, I think um, again, well, in engineering, it's a demographic issue, uh, and in biomed, a lot of our, our women actually just want to go to medical school. Um, but there are, uh, for example, the CSO of Upraxia here in Victoria is a woman who's a BME. And so, uh, me personally, why I, I, I've had some money to spend some of my research off into startups, and we're still incubating, but there is a very well-defined system through NSERC, I think if you're a professor and you have an idea, to take your idea to innovation and actually do it all within the system quite reasonably without out as much risk, which is what, um, if and if I ever have an idea that I really believe in, that would be the way I would go to starting a company. But I think the, the resources and, and things are available. Maybe it's not as broadcast as well as it should be, but definitely there are pathways and, and people are doing it. Uh, we just need, well, more women in engineering in general, so. <laughs> Oh, and Nicole's here this afternoon from Flightographer. Yeah. <laughs> She's an example. If I could add one more thing to that. There's also um, a piece about, and I know this from working with girls learning code, is that um, girls, women, the psychology is kind of about being perfect and um, not making mistakes. And so they'd rather not risk than, make, than fail. And so um, uh, actually just on Saturday we were at a... a St. Margaret's School doing Girls Learning Code and I was working with this this eight-year-old girl and, and she she did her code and it was working perfectly and I said, awesome, it's great, now break it and figure out, and then and she was just like, what? Why would you do that? Like she got it working perfectly. I was like, yeah, so break it. And then she's like, oh. So she erased some code and then got the error message. I'm like, yeah, so you know, it's just deeper learning to but you know that's different to encourage someone to do it, break it, do it again, break it. So it kind of messes with their minds. <laughs> Maybe also touch on why. What is it that keeps women out of entrepreneurship? What is the? Why are there so few women entrepreneurs? Do you think? Sorry. <laughs> As somebody, as somebody whose home department is, uh, again, mechanical has, uh, engineering has similar issues. I think it's uh, partially networking and a lot of things with entrepreneurship are, are people who come together um, socially and, I, and e even engineers. Socially might mean, you know, spending all your hours together doing your homework. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the issues is, is networking and, and getting out there. Um, and again, it's kind of like engineering, you know, it's one of those things where you're more likely if you've been exposed to it. And so it's not something that, you know, is you, you don't take a high school course in entrepreneurship, you know. So I think that that's one of the things is just knowing that it's a possibility out there. Oh, are you are, we're going to implement yeah. a high school course? Yeah. <laughs> Let's implement a high school course. You know, just ex exposing people to that. And like, uh, if, you know, I mean, if you look at how women are socialized as, as children and things like that, you know, it's, it's not something that's necessarily bred into them, so. And, and again, I think even with engineering, you see this. Um, so engineering is, is, is mostly male, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's how it was uh, selected, right? So it, there are also groups of men, I think, that aren't, <laughs> engineering has no appeal to that we aren't reaching, which also might fit into the same category as like how females are socialized, so I think that's an issue. 
one quick one is uh, I did a, um, a pitch down in San Francisco with Johnson & Johnson, uh, won $50,000 in four months in an incubator there, and was working with the uh, consulate uh, general there from Canada, and we were told, we were pulled aside, and this was a Canadian program, we were pulled aside and we said, you Canadians, <laughs> you know, so maybe this is, you know, something for us all. You Canadians come down here, and you ask for like $250,000. <laughs> You're not thinking big enough. Canadians don't think big enough. So like, I mean, I've been told it's because I'm a woman. I've been told I'm because I'm Canadian. It's been told, you know, all of these things. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I, you know, I, I, I need to understand the culture, I guess. And we were certainly told in no uncertain terms that Canadians across the board really have a hard time in San Francisco because they don't think big enough. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Other questions from the crowd? I have a daughter who's six, um, and I'm just a general question: What can I do at this stage to start getting her on the right path if this is something she's interested in? There are amazing online resources for that, and I would encourage you to uh, connect in with Ladies Learning Code and Girls Learning Code, and we provide uh, lots of resources for that. But um, typically our local courses start at eight years old. Uh, we have had a few six-year-olds come in, so she would be welcome, but you know, you probably need to be with her. And uh, the main thing is that just making it really fun and uh, connecting it to, to a project. You know, they all end up with a project that they build every day, you know, each when they do a one-day course. So it's, it's very connected to the outcome. Uh, I think there is a lot to be said for what you can do, you know, just to sort of nourish her own curiosity like you would anybody, you know, and it's just to make sure that she's got the resources that she can explore and you can point her to places and we can help you find them too, like online communities where kids program and share their programs and remix their programs and this is the scratch programming language. Just, there's a lot of stuff out there and I think that a lot of times maybe, and I have no idea, I don't have a six-year-old or anything, but parents are like, oh, let's get the kids off the computers and for sure. I mean, you don't want them on there all the time. You don't want them just playing games. Although play games is, you know, if they're interested and curious, if you just feed what she's loving, you know, <laughs> and make sure that you're also helping her get a little bit more maybe educated about how it's all working too, I think that's just awesome. And the fact, again, that you're here is a big testament to who you are. From the other side of the world, I would say buy her a chemistry set, because that's what I got when I was five. Um, and I was like a very bad child, uh, so I took all the things that they said, like, do not mix, and I was like, oh, I'll be in the backyard, mom and dad, <laughs> making things <laughs> explode. Um, I'd say chemistry sets and Legos. Also, Science Venture is a great program. The other thing, which I didn't realize until I read, uh, there's actually the INSERC Women in Science and Engineering Chair. They published a book, and there's all these great resources. But in high school, make sure she takes uh, math and physics, because I didn't realize that one of these big barricades to people entering engineering is actually determined by what courses they take in high school. And so that's something to, so they don't, so like they're saying that, you know, uh, um, women in high school who don't take these courses and they can't even go into engineering because of these choices they made. So um, just to keep them cognizant of that. So. One quick thing too is that there's lots of hardware, like like um, Adafruit is a wearable, you know, you can build your own kind of flashing lights and that kind of stuff. There's lots of project-based hands-on, like if you, maybe she loves the chemistry sets, that's great too, but there's lots of Arduinos and all sorts of things. Um, in the UK, they're giving all kids this little um, baby computer that they can wire up and build things. So if it, maybe it's not blowing things up in the backyard, but it's lighting things up. I'm sure they could mix it with their chemistry set and have fun. <laughs> just fun. Yeah, and there's one called Little Bits too. We just had a Maker Day in January that had Arduinos and Little Bits. Um, and just anecdotally, I remember as a child, um, just the, this incredibly impactful thing that my father did when um, we had just had a little clock that broke. And instead of just having a clock that broke and you go, oh, that's broken, we're gonna go buy a new clock. He said, let's take it apart and see why it broke, what's inside? And that just totally revolutionized my world of like, things aren't mysterious, there's actually problems to solve, which is interesting. And then when she lives on her own and her toilet breaks, she could just like open it. And she's just <laughs> like, oh, that's simple to fix. 
<laughs> as somebody who once fixed my boyfriend's toilet. <laughs> Um, so I think that maybe the main theme there was follow her lead, you know, like what is she interested in and, and how can that be, you know, how can you tie that back into tech? And also um, there's a website called A Mighty Girl. I have a young daughter, she's much younger than yours, but there's books you can read and stuff like that and just, yeah, see what she likes. and Don't push her too hard because my father wanted me to be an artist and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah, totally backfired. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, good. So, so maybe I'm off topic, so shut me down um, if I am. But uh, my, we've talked a lot about the engineering side, talked a lot about a little bit on entrepreneurship. Um, there's a pretty big problem with women in business programs as well. Um, you know, just from everything of the way that they are they're socialized in classes and things like that. Um, so on the business side of the house, is there anything different we should look at to, to encourage there, be it in hiring, education, what are your thoughts on that side? Feel free to pass it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, and I'm sorry because I'm going to draw it back to computer science. <laughs> but, you know, again, from the ivory tower up there, you know, there's this business entrepreneurial program, which I think is attracting a nice diverse set of people. This is, this is great, so it's very stimulating. But I, you know, we're not working together with them to make it, uh, to have a real technical side to it. So I, 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 I don't want to make it all about that, but I, I feel a little bit like, so all the creative and exciting vibe that goes with entrepreneurialism and that spirit and that agile technology kind of side to it all, I, th I hope that that's what's going to maybe again stimulate some of the diversity. But I also feel like, boy, I, I hope that it's not just you're a business person or you're a technical person. I hope that it's going to be something that you've got it all going on. <laughs> for, for sure, just I, I just want to kind of maybe tag on there a little that the interesting thing about business is that there is a better diversity, yeah. but there's not a better diversity in leadership. Uh, and in entrepreneurship, and that's kind of, a, I think, the bigger thing that, that you can get 50-50, but if we don't actually get 50-50 in, in the true sense, um, how do we make sure that when we get to diversity, because let's, let's all be hopeful that we'll get there, um, how do we make sure it works? Oh, did you want thoughts? Oh. Yeah, we, should, oh we, can, we can wrap it up. Yeah, we got to, what, are, oh, yeah. what are the biggest challenges you faced in your career, and how did you overcome them? What are the biggest challenges you <laughs> faced in your career, and how did you overcome them? Actually, this answer kind of relates to your question as well. So the um, uh, biggest challenge in my career was um, I co-founded and uh, was the only woman on the executive team um, for an enterprise software company. And uh, we, we did great things. We grew it to $20 million valuation in a year and a half. That was very exciting. And then the company failed six months later. And that was very... Painful and not exciting. Um, still exciting, actually. <laughs> a lot of, lot of <laughs> drama. <laughs> yeah, a lot of drama. Um, but the, you know, in reflecting on all of that, of course, and looking at, okay, where, you know, where did I fail? What did I do? And what, what could I have done better? Um, I had a real lack of confidence in uh, my leadership. And so where I actually had intuition about what we should do and what we shouldn't do, and I actually had ideas for solutions of how to get us out of this tailspin we were in, um, I didn't have the confidence to to really lead with that. And, and I had a lot of great advisors, and later we had um, management consultants come in and you know evaluate what we did and what we could have done, and, and they really confirmed, like, that yeah, you, you should have done what you thought you should have done. And you know, granted, I was, you know, had never run a company like that before. So, you know, anyone who's brand new in leadership it can deal can struggle with that confidence. But um but there was another element of, of being um being the only woman on the team and having a team of um you know other uh male colleagues that that also were somewhat questioning what I was doing, and you know, it was not a supportive environment, you can imagine. <laughs> so a flaming <laughs> company going down is not really a supportive environment. <laughs> but that's true of anywhere. But, um, so, but there is a key thing here about um, 
and I would encourage, you know, particularly uh, all the men in the audience, is, um, you know, when, when women speak in meetings, it, there's also research that uh, their voices aren't heard. Literally, they've measured this in, at Harvard. Their voices just aren't heard. Um, and so often a woman will ask a question or make a comment, and whether it's in a board meeting or whatever, in a classroom, and their voice won't be heard. And later a man will ask that same question or say that same comment, and everyone will be, yeah, like Joe said, that was such a great point that Joe made. And, you know, the women in the audience or in the group usually are not, you know, going to say, hey, I already made that point. So it's really um, incumbent on the group as a whole, if we want to shift this in business, is, is actually for other men in the room to say, yeah, Joe, that was a great point you made that was uh, piggybacked right on exactly what Sue said 10 minutes ago, you know, just to like, and, and maybe open up the floor more for Sue, do you want to expand on that anymore? You know, so just that kind of level of awareness and listening. Mine's so easy because <laughs> I've been in academia, or I was a college teacher for a lot of years before I went to the university, but, um, and I remember uh, one of my first days on the job in the college, I was called into the president's <laughs> office and I thought, oh, okay, great, I'm gonna be welcomed into the family here. <laughs> and it was a little bit of a welcoming. And then I, I was told, okay, so you're a woman and you're in computer science, so you gotta solve this problem. Like that was, 25, 30 years ago, I, I'm like, okay, I can't really solve this problem. So one of the challenges is the one that we're talking about here, <laughs> biggest challenge. And, and in terms of uh, how I've tried to address it is, you know, synergy with, first of all, the women that are on this panel for sure, and the people that are in this room and realizing that, you know, together we can start to make some changes, but we need to be strategic and we need to think together and we need to listen to each other, think about the four-year-old, think about the 18-year-old and think about the 50-year-old. <laughs> God, I'm like such a, I'm such an engineer, no, I'm such an engineer because I'm like, oh, we need more tri-council funding so I can do more research. <laughs> and I would also like more biotech companies here in British Columbia I can work with. Um, yeah, I think one of the, the issues, especially uh, being an engineer and again, so few women is uh, having to be like the voice of sanity on so many issues. And it's not even just women issues, I actually think this goes to business and any field, um, what makes people hyper competitive and who win some of these things that are, are, are very competitive doesn't necessarily make them a nice person or a good colleague. And while it may be that you just end up with a bunch of hyper competitive men in an atmosphere, it doesn't mean it's necessarily good for anyone in the group. And so uh, I think just, um, I mean, because my department at, at UVic Mechanical is very collegial and, and welcoming, but I've also seen engineering departments where they aren't nice to anyone and the women just leave because it's a toxic environment and, um, and then that's who's left is not. Uh. So I think that that's something um, I try to do is try and remember like you can have your own set of standards of how you behave and it might not be how everyone else in your field behaves but as long as you feel good about what you're doing then that's I think what really matters and that sounds really hippie but uh, please everyone else raise lots and lots of money and start biotech companies. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panel.